Okay, Sherry, it looks like we currently have 46 and growing. Um, so if you want to give it just um, another second for people to jump on and then we can get started. You see Colin close. Mm -hmm. He's got his hand up. I'm not sure if he's trying to get promoted. Thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Good eye, Paul. Gray seems to be the background color of choice this evening. Is mine okay? Should I change mine? Yeah, you look great. Okay, Sherry. So it looks like we're at about 55. Okay, thank you. and you should be able to see my screen now. Great, perfect job, Michelle, thanks. Claire, do you wanna get us started? Yes, well, welcome everyone. Um, we are thrilled to be able to offer a meeting that's specialized for our hosts and uh, of short-term rentals. We wanted a opportunity to talk with you about our upcoming urgency ordinance related to short-term rentals. Uh, and to hear from you, we have a draft out now, so we can get more specific in terms of comments and questions. Um, and our ordinance is headed to the city council on October 12th. So we'll get into that shortly. But first, I want to kick off the meeting and um, I will introduce our team. But before we get started, I'd like to talk about just set some ground rules so we can be productive tonight. Um, so next slide. So, there's a lot of words here, but really what it boils down to is, you know, we have an interest in hearing from everyone. Um, and so we definitely want to give an opportunity for everyone to have a chance to speak or ask a question. Uh, there's a big city team here um, that will be listening and will be monitoring, taking notes. There will be an opportunity for us to report back on what we're hearing if there's themes. Um, so we just want to be respectful and also be productive. So if you, uh, if you hear us asking uh, for you to, to um, wrap up, or if you have comments that uh, reflect prior comments, it would be efficient uh, just to say so um, and to, to speak, you know, what, what hasn't been said would be helpful as well. So with that, let's get started. So first slide here. Okay, great. So I'm gonna present the background, but before I start with my slides here, and my name is Claire Hartman. I'm the interim assistant city manager for the city of Santa Rosa. I wanted to introduce the city team that's here tonight. Um, and I know there's been some questions about, you know, so many staff members involved in this and why, and we'll touch on that as we go into the ordinance. You'll see there's elements that really do touch every element of the city, um, whether it's finance or, permitting or um, economic development. So we really are approaching this comprehensively and it shows because we're all involved and we're all here to listen. So I'll just go through the list of all our folks here. Um, and uh, let's see, we've got Alan Alton. He's with our finance team. We have Andrew Triple. He's with our planning permitting team. Uh, Cece Morella, she's with CODE. She also oversees our, our permit counter. Uh, Colin Close, he's here representing water. We have Captain John Cregan representing the police department. Paul Lowenthal representing the fire department. We have Jesse Oswell, he's our chief building official. And we have Raisa De La Rosa representing economic development. And last but not least, because she's been facilitating us all along, is Sherry Meads. And she is the project planner that is uh, facilitating this process and facilitating all of us through it and collecting all of your comments and moving it forward. So 
thanks to the team for showing up tonight and we'll go ahead and get started and talk, talk about the ordinance that uh, will be presented to the city council. So a little bit of background. Um, I would say this initiative uh, emerged through sort of a layering of public comments that were coming into the city, city staff, all of us that we just introduced, coming in all these different channels, whether it's to the water or to police or fire, uh, comments about questions about uh, if and how and why not um, are short-term rentals regulated, uh, complaints, um, and they were also going to our city council. So it emerged as a topic of discussion and we brought it to the Economic Development Subcommittee in August of this year. And we did present qualitative information um, about the information and complaints that we received. And a lot of it had to do with concerns about public safety, particularly entering into a wild, wild um, fire season early, earlier than even years previous, um, and just concerns about uh, uh, this use uh, not being regulated, not being registered, not being monitored, um, and no operational standards such as um, parking requirements or just circulation needs uh, for especially our fire areas. But we also heard a lot about housing preservation interests. Um, and so um, this issue was discussed at the Economic Development Subcommittee in August. And at that time, they did direct us to tackle the whole thing. Um, we, we presented all the, all the items that had come before us through emails about an interest in looking at parking, an interest in looking at occupancy, um, potential over-concentration on, on a street in a neighborhood or on the, the, the city. Um, and so we, we put out all the different ways you could touch um, looking at regulating short-term rentals. And they, they wanted us to come back with a comprehensive urgency ordinance to address that. Next slide. We can get to the next slide. So first, oh, one, yeah, there we go. One back there. Slide four. Sorry, I'm having an issue with my PowerPoint. Give me just one second and I'll get you back to Okay, yeah, four. so I'll keep going and we'll get there. So we're gonna get to, back to slide four. So one of the first things we did is we didn't wanna just go back to our desks and, and, and sort of just create this. So we immediately, we didn't have a lot of time because the direction was an urgency ordinance. They want us to come back as soon as possible. Uh, and so we built in this opportunity for public comment. and. So we came up with a public survey and we got it out as soon as possible. Well, it was the second most responded to survey the city has ever done. So it was stunning um, how many participants were uh, interested enough to participate in a city survey. Um, and so as you can see here, here's the statistics, um, you know, almost 2,400 respondents to our survey. Um, and we, we can talk a little bit more about what came out of that survey. We have, um, we have summarized results on our city's website, short-term rentals at srcity.org um, is our website that we're posting any information that we have, you know, obviously the draft, um, but things that um, we are becoming aware of, we're, we're putting on that website. But in addition to just survey responses, it is multiple choice. Uh, predominantly, uh, a lot of respondents also took the time to write individual comments. So we literally have paid, you know, hundreds of pages to go through and review. And so we, all of us are reading through them and wanting to be informed about what's of interest, whether you are a resident um, living near um, short-term rentals or whether you are hosting short-term rentals. Um, and so we have, um, again, put that on the webpage. Next. Claire, Sorry. can I just interject one thing? Raisa, yeah. um, we all, Raisa is uh, managing the chat function. So if folks have questions that they wanna just go ahead and put in there, we won't necessarily get to them now, but it'll give us a chance to um, have a running start, if you will. Also, um, Raisa, if you don't mind, could you put the website into the chat link in case folks don't have that easily available? Thank you. That's Sorry. no great, great catch there. Um, okay, so next slide. In addition to 
reaching out to the public. Um, we started to convene weekly meetings. In fact, um, sometimes it's twice a week. And I, I think as, as some of our staff members have noted, uh, you know, it's into the evenings. We are dedicated to hearing as much information as possible. We don't take it lightly um, to produce an ordinance like this. And even if it's in short order, it doesn't negate the, 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 the care that we wanna put in into it. Um, so all of these departments have been involved again it's been a learning process. We didn't quite realize when we first started that it touched so many different departments, but we have now since learned that. And so we're working with that, that new knowledge. Um, and you know, we don't wanna produce an ordinance that isn't clear, isn't effective, isn't balanced, and also can't be enforced. So we, we wanted to put that lens on it as well. Um, we're not just writing an ordinance for the sake of writing an ordinance. It needs to fit with Santa Rosa and it needs to be realistic and reasonable. Uh, next slide. So with that in mind, we realized we would be quite challenged creating that reasonable, clear, enforceable ordinance that is that comprehensive that would cover all the topics that we pre um, presented on in August. Um, and so we went back to the Economic Development Subcommittee uh, just last week, and we asked for additional time to develop that comprehensive ordinance. We want to spend more time uh, learning and engaging the, the public. And we wanna spend more time, um, especially looking long-term at how a program would be um, set up, funded, monitored, and successful. In the meantime, we do honor the issues that were raised um, that was the impetus for the effort um, and the sense of urgency around um, safety and housing preservation. Um, and so we are committed to um, pr presenting a draft uh, as lean as we can, while still just focus, laser focused on the most immediate operational issues. Um, and also uh, to acknowledge the industry and to actually have a uh, registration type of process. So that's that's been the background of what got us here. Um, we did produce a draft. We did put that out um, recently. And that's what we're gonna go over tonight is what, what's in that draft. And uh, we're collecting comments tonight. We're collecting questions. Uh, and all of that will be forwarded and presented also to the city council on the, October 12th. And yes, we will. Uh, we can also make this PowerPoint available on our website as well. And this meeting is recorded, so we can make use of it. Um, mm -hmm. as, uh, you can refer back to it or, or share it. And that concludes my part of the presentation that Sherry is gonna walk us through the draft urgency ordinance. And um, we also have um, our team members here are, are also gonna participate in that on certain sections. So next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna just take over for Claire who did such a great kickoff and mention where we've promoted the draft urgency ordinance to try to get it um, before as many eyes as possible. So we have published it as Claire mentioned to the website. Um, we, I have an uh, interested parties mailing list where I, I try to send up updates to folks that have reached out to me, um, whether they're interested in starting a short-term rental or interested in seeing regulations um, passed for them. And I sent it out to that group, which is about 150 people. And it's also gonna be published in the City Connections newsletter. Um, it went out on the social media accounts, Nextdoor, Twitter, Facebook um, on the 24th. So next slide, please. And what is in the draft urgency ordinance? I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. My guess is that most of the folks on this call have already reviewed it. They're, they're pretty knowledgeable, but I wanna get through um, some high level points and then we'll, get, we'll be able to spend some time with public comment, which will be um, after, after this little presentation. So the draft urgency ordinance defines what a short term rental is. It um, establishes a permit and re registration requirement. It provides occupancy standards and parking requirements and operational standards and an enforcement um, procedure. So next slide, please. So definitions, hosted short-term rental, as most of you probably know, is when the owner um, is in residence during the period that the short-term rental is rented. Non-hosted means there's no owner present at the time the short-term rental is being occupied. Next slide, please. So 
as most of you know, right now there is no permit requirement for hosted or non-hosted short-term rentals. They are still required um, to be registered with the finance department for transient occupancy tax and business improvement area assessment payments quarterly. So we're looking at um, establishing a short-term rental permit that will allow us to monitor, you know, how many there are in the city um, and evaluate how they fit into where they are looking to be located. So next slide, please. Occupancy standards. Um, many of you have probably said, um, I'm going to look at other jurisdictions and see what they do. We're pretty, we're pretty much in line with most other jurisdictions where we're allowing two people per bedroom. We're maxim, max, maximize, we're with a maximum, sorry about that, occupancy of 10 persons per short-term rental. Um, additional daytime guests are allowed. And one of the things that we've heard so much about is the danger of having um, parking spilling into um, travel lanes that are blocking hydrants that are, you know, preventing the ability for emergency uh, evacuation and emergency access. So we're having um, a minimum parking requirement of one off street space per bedroom. Um, sites downtown um, are not required to have that type of parking because that's just, that's just the rule. Downtown um, does not have parking minimums for residential or commercial uses. Where it's available, one on street space can count towards that parking minimum. Next slide, please. And the operational standards, I'm going to let Paul Lowenthal, Assistant Fire Marshal, and John Cregan, Police Captain, go over that stuff because that is right in their wheelhouse and they're awesome. So starting off first uh, with life safety requirements. Uh, so we've heard uh, from uh, both uh, people in and around uh, the short-term rentals, uh, as well as in some cases, people uh, owning the short-term rentals, uh, the concerns and some things that they're doing to help minimize or mitigate some of those risks. Uh, we've uh, looked at what we can do at a high level to start tackling some of those immediate uh, high priority issues. So with that, uh, we have looked at, uh, like Sherry was talking about, uh, some of the issues uh, that will be identified under the parking requirements that help will, will help to ensure our emergency access for firefighters, uh, for evacuations, and just for normal routine traffic flow uh, is uh, adhered to. Uh, and then shifting gears a little bit, uh, one of the things that we really are going to push or that is included in this thing that we're uh, making sure is included in the process is what we refer to uh, as POTS. And that's basically an acronym for a landline or a, um, a hardwired phone for the home or any sort of voice uh, IP phone. So essentially, the owner of the short-term rental will be required to register that address we refer to here locally as SoCo Alert. So if there is an emergency alert, the resident or the, the occupant uh, of the short-term rental that's typically not from the area will be able to receive uh, an emergency alert if they are at the residence. Um, as again, as an effort for us to help uh, mitigate the risk of them being a, potentially being an evacuation zone, which then jumps into point number two, uh, which is our uh, requirement to ensure that they've got the know your alerts flyers, uh, know your ways out, evacuation zones, posted and available so that the people there uh, have the access to the information, especially um, given what we've experienced here over the last several years, we want them to have the information they need and not potentially be part of our problem. Um, and also uh, moving into uh, some of the issues and concerns regarding outdoor fire pits. So we took a lot of language uh, that comes straight out of the California fire code. In some cases, some of this language would typically uh, exempt a typical single family dwelling uh, with the type of occupancies and some of the concerns that we've seen and are working to address, we've included a lot of that language uh, in the requirements to help uh, ensure that any outdoor fires that do take place are taking place uh, in a manner that keeps uh, the residents that are utilizing the occupancy as well as our community safe. And then I'll let John pick up. Thank you, Paul. So the next couple ones I go through are pretty self-explanatory, but we'll go through some of the details listed in the draft ordinance. The first one is the quiet hours between 9 p.m. and 8 a.m. And a lot of these are about a balance. And the balance is between the residents who live in the neighborhood of these short-term rentals, and then those who are actually the short-term rental operators are still wanting to be able to uh, have uh, people rent out these homes, 
but it's all about the balance. And one of the number one complaints we're getting from the police to the police department is about people out, out in the backyards at a fire pit going into 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And sometimes it's not even that the group is necessarily having a party, but when you get 10, 15 people in a backyard drinking in a hot tub or at a fire pit, it gets loud and it keeps the neighbors in the area up. And then that's where the calls start flooding into us. So it's important from the police department's perspective to have that 9 p.m. to be able to get people to be able to gently nudge them to go inside and still be able to enjoy the short-term rental there, but without disturbing the peace of the neighborhood. So that's an important one for us. The other one that leads to a lot of complaints is the large events at the house. So if you look at the short-term rental ordinance, it talks about events are prohibited and it talks about not limited to, but including weddings, reception, corporate events, and two of the ones that we just I just received this week coming into the police department is a large wedding being held at a residential neighborhood at a house with 60 plus cars in the neighborhood blocking the road. We had to have officers go out to the wedding to start doing traffic control. And that's where it, it that's where it becomes not only a danger to those there in the residence when emergency vehicles have a difficulty uh, entering or exiting the area, but even neighbors were having a difficult time getting out of that. And the same thing was a large event held at another one uh, of a commercial event and they were having a show there and multiple people. So that's what it's trying to prohibit and keeping it to residential neighborhoods, keeping it what the residential neighborhoods are intended to be. The advertising and listing requirements, that one is again, again too about this talking about putting some of the key restrictions that are in the ordinance. So those living at the home are staying at the home temporarily for that time, understand that. And that's what a lot of this ordinance is going to do is be able to say, what are some of the rules so the neighbors understand the clear rules, the short term rental operators know, and then the tenants staying at those home know, what are the basic rules? And I think that's really going to eliminate a lot of the plaints we have coming in, because right now when it's so just vague about what are the requirements, then it's kind of up to the individual operators and what rules they individually come up with. So on the advertisement, it has five key components that need to be there the maximum occupancy, the maximum number of vehicles, the quiet hour time, the notification of no amplified music, and then the permit number for the short-term rental to show the city that you've got that permit and that you're actually following the basic rules and guidelines here. And those five things would have to be on any advertisements that are going out, whether it be social media, flyers, internet listings, or obviously through the short-term rental hosting sites. The next one we talk about is posting and notifications to the neighbors. And that is saying that two things, that inside the short-term rental, that you're gonna have posted these rules and regulations again to educate those tenants and hopefully get that voluntary compliance, which is what we're really hoping to get here. And that helps take the onus off the neighbors calling in without city staff between code enforcement and the police department, which both struggle with the staffing to enforce these things. So if we can get that voluntary compliance, it's in all of our benefits for it. And then so posting that for them. And then secondly, of doing a notification to the neighbors. So the way the ordinance written in right now is that any neighbor, any residents within 600 feet of the short-term rental would get a formal notification from the operator. And it's gonna be a notice that's approved by the planning director talking about the desire to make that a short-term rental and giving them sufficient notice of that. And again, a lot of the complaints that come in are just because people are surprised, they don't know what's going on. So just like we see in all areas uh, of just of everything, it's just communication. If we communicate with the neighbors, we communicate with the residents, it really, I think, is going to be able to bring us all together. So everyone from their own perspectives are going to get what they need. And I'll let Paul talk about the last one with the accessibility retirement uh, requirement. So we do have language in here that refers back to, at a minimum, the various codes that range from the building code uh, to the fire code and beyond. And so with the number of departments that are involved in this from police department, code enforcement, uh, fire building, uh, we have the ability to then uh, have access to the property for inspection as needed. So um, this again is kind of the minimum they have uh, to adhere to the most uh, significant requirements, um, our ability to enforce them, inspect as needed. Um, and we foresee under the comprehensive ordinance, um, an expansion of, uh, many more requirements beyond this that, again, we'll keep those utilizing it and those immediately around it uh, as safe as we can make them. So, Michelle, I think we're ready to move to the next slide. Um, before you do, Paul, can you just speak to a couple of questions that came up? Um, sure. 
I think it's under fire is um, the line, it is not intended for local contact. This might be either you or John. It is not intended that the local contact place themselves in an at-risk situation to comply with the requirement. And that's having to do with um, uh, responding to uh, issues. And I think, I'm not exactly sure what, where the line came from, the quote of that line came from, but I think it is um, in a state of, in an issue of emergency or something like that. Um, does that make sense? I'm, let me let me see if I can answer that. So, is the person wondering um, about the response time requirement? Well, there are a few questions about the response times in terms of forty five minutes. Um, but the the question it says under the enforcement section, the line quote: "It is not intended that the local contact place themselves in an at risk situation to comply with this requirement." I believe it is the time uh, requirement. Um, I don't know if that is a, a fire thing, and we could address that later. It, it it's a fire thing. It's any type of situation where um, the local contact feels threatened that if they went into the situation, it could be dangerous, in which case we would not want them to be that first um, line of communication. That would obviously be a 911 call. Um, the 45 minutes is so that there we have to set some type of standard jurisdictions um, range from 30 minutes to, to an hour. I just split it down the middle because the idea is not necessarily if there's a wedding happening, you're able to clear it in 45 minutes. Um, so maybe I need to tweak the wording um, a little bit. The idea is that you're there on site, if need be, taking care of whatever the issue is. If there's too many cars parked, then you're there, you know, directing people that they need to move their cars. If there are too many people, you're asking those that are not supposed to be there to leave that type of thing. Um, and so the the idea is that the local contact, it can be anyone, you can hire a property management, it can be the owner, it can be whoever, that person has to be designated in the application, but that person has to be available knowing that that is their role. It, does that help? I think, yeah, and I think, I think to just clarify a little bit more, I think where I used to go in and maybe the question is, um, they do the that local contact will have requirements to adhere to whether they come from police code enforcement or fire that although there are times outlined for their response it is not our intention that the responsible party put themselves in harm to adhere to that so if there's a condition whether it's a wildfire something going on where we would not physically want that person to put themselves in harm's way to comply with the order the ordinance Perfect. And um, we'll hold some of the other questions for later. I just wanted to make sure to get that piece of it in terms of uh, when uh, Paul and John were talking. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, going into the enforcement aspect of it, uh, we set up enforcement uh, penalties that are kind of broken down as a three tier type enforcement response. So the initial complaint, as we already talked about, would be directed to the 24-7 contact. So the, the contact that's stated on the application that is to be responding um, throughout that entirety of that uh, rental time. So if we do obtain a call or complaint um, and we validate that, in fact, there is a violation, the initial violation penalty would be a total of $500 with education and the education component is really going through what's required again uh, by the permit holder to adhere to. So any regulations of the um, short-term rental rules, making sure that they're in compliance and also letting them know that further complaints would result in escalated enforcement to the point where they may even uh, end up with revocation of a permit. So if we end up with a secondary violation within a one year's time from the issuance of that short-term rental permit, that penalty calculation would then increase to $1,000 with a last or third violation being $2,000 with the permit being revoked for violation of any of the regulations in the short-term rental uh, ordinance. So this is to ensure that you know, we're, we're having compliance with the short-term rental ordinance, in addition to being able to encourage voluntary compliance, as was already stated by um, uh, John, and in addition to that, to follow neighborly 
good neighborly practices with the neighbors surrounding these specific short-term rentals. Okay, so back to me. Um, so the next steps are obviously to uh, continue hearing from the public, but bringing the urgency ordinance to city council for the public hearing on October 12th. If the council accepts the ordinance as is or modifies it, um, either way, it would be effective immediately if adopted. After that, we're gonna continue working on a comprehensive approach, iron out any kinks that we discover through this process. It's obviously gonna be a new program for us. We're trying to get it right the first time, but you know, it, it, we may learn from, from what we have out there after October 12th and end up making significant modifications. Um, but we know there will be additional things that we'll be looking at and that will go through the planning commission and city council um, sometime in 2022. We'd love it to be early in the year, but it just all depends how, um, how council priorities roll out and, and resources available. So next slide, please. And that's really it for the presentation. Um, we're here to hear from you guys. It looks like there's quite a few questions in the chat that we can get to. Um, Claire did a great job of introducing everybody. I wanna add that um, if I missed anybody, I probably did. I know Jesse um, Osborne is also on the call, chief building official, so. Um, Sherry, um, we have, I've uh, sort of categorized a number of the questions that have come in. Wonderful. Um, so maybe what we can do is um, go through um, the ones that I've captured thus far. Um, and a lot of it is about enforcement, but um, quickly there is one about zoning um, and allowable zoning. Um, is there a reason that the uh, commercial office and historic combining districts are not included in the permitted zones in the draft ordinance for short-term rentals? Well, I'm gonna actually stop sharing screen. Oh, that's right. I'm not sure, I'm not doing the presentation. I didn't have to do it. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we're constantly evaluating this. Um, we wanted to put something out there as soon as possible, but it's definitely, you know, something that we're looking at up until, I think I have until tomorrow to make any changes to it. And, and we're talking about the zoning districts and where it makes sense and where it might make sense to expand them. Um, so stay tuned on that one. Okay, um, the next one, um, parking. Um, are, are newer developments required to provide one off park, one off site parking spot per bedroom if this were really a safety slash fire hydrant issue with city streets? I'm not sure I understand the difference. Um, uh, so I think it is a question of new development versus you know, old homes or perhaps residential development. I mean, uh, uh, areas, uh, developments or residences within the wooey kind of thing. Well, I mean, the, the parking hits on a number of issues. Safety is obviously the most key one, um, but it also is somewhat of a, um, a nuisance factor and quality of life issue in the neighborhood. So at this point, we are requiring the same parking everywhere. And again, that's something that if, if over time, once this ordinance is in place, we realize that doesn't work, then when the comprehensive um, ordinance comes through, that's something we can look to amending. Uh, okay, so also in parking, um, well, there are some comments that the parking rules should apply to everyone in the neighborhood and not just short-term uh, uh, rentals, but everyone on the street. Um, and then there was a uh, request to uh, restate the suggested parking language, but um, we can refer people to the ordinance unless there's a quick way to, um, to restate that. Well, it's basically one off street parking space per bedroom. So if you have a three bedroom house that you're renting out, that would mean say one in the garage, two in the driveway, you're done. Um, if you have a four bedroom house, you could still have two in the garage, two in the driveway. If you don't have a two car garage, one, of the gar one in the garage, two in the driveway, one on the street, you're, you're covered. So we try to make it not super restrictive, um, assuming that if these are short term rentals, especially on a full time basis, the, the non hosted versions, then we would think that maybe the garage is empty and should be available for, for that use. 
Uh, okay, I'm going to go through some things. There are a lot of questions about enforcement, um, and I'm going to try to consolidate them. But in starting with um, our wedding uh, enforcement specifically related to short term rentals or for any residents who may be having a party. Um, so I think there's a concern that um, that is isolated um, uh, or inconsistent um, application of this rule uh, versus a private home. I can jump in and then maybe CC or, or um, Jesse can add if there's more that needs to be said. So the difference between a short term rental having a wedding and your neighbor having a wedding is that most likely the neighbor having a wedding it's an unusual circumstance. It's a, it's, a, it's a rare occasion. And we would like to believe that you would at least have a, enough of a relationship with your neighbor that you could comment about, you know, if there was excessive noise or, or drunken revelers throwing up on your yard or whatever could possibly go wrong. Um, whereas a short term rental could technically do that every single day of the year. And so it does make sense to have different regulations for a short term rental where the people are transient um, and, and turnover is great and there's not that relationship with your neighbors or the um, likelihood that these types of things would happen more frequently with travelers that are, are specifically going somewhere to, to have such an event. Um, and then I'll leave it to, to Cece or John, or I'm sorry, or Jesse or whoever. Yeah, that's, I think that's a perfect explanation. So when it comes to short-term rentals, we want to stay away from having these be looked at or um, seen as event or venue places um, to hold these type of events. Whereas Sherry explained, it's significantly different when you have maybe an isolated event at a residential uh, property versus the advertisement of short-term rentals for purposes of, hey, this is an event place, you can come and have these events here. So that's why that language is there. And that's why there's that difference or that fine line difference between the two. And that said, Cece, if somebody had, you know, a, a, a complaint about noise or, or something such as that, that would still be something that would res be responded to based on the city code. Absolutely. It doesn't take away from the enforcement component or um, the applicability of staying within regulation on any of those events. Okay, there are a few questions about the noise ordinance and the um, the quiet hours applying. Um, so, uh, do the quiet hours apply to weekends? Um, that is currently at 10 p.m. Amplified music. Does does this mean radios? Um, uh, so, I mean, I think there are questions about um, understanding better understanding the quiet hours, uh, and um, I think that's it, or are you talking mostly about parties? So it, like, how are we, and th these questions sort of relate to um, how, how will it be enforced? Because uh, the other piece of it is, um, let's see, uh, will, will, uh, will police or code respond within the 45 minutes as well? Um, uh, and how are, how are complaints and violations gonna be verified? So there's some concern about um, what the noise ordinance is and how, how they'll be responded to. Should I take that one? Okay, so the noise, I mean, some of, the, some of it is just common sense. Um, if it's noisy, meaning if somebody at the property line would feel that there's too, you know what I mean? I, I, gosh, somebody help me here. Well, I think too that we'll be able to get. Currently, what we're getting routinely is people calling the police department to report large parties or people out in a hot tub at one in the morning, and they're they're sending us videos of those things. So that's going to be some of the things. But if an officer goes out there and the officer is going to write in the notes and the call saying, "I went out to one two three Main Street and there was fifteen people in a hot tub and they were loudly." Uh, uh, audible from down the street, then that's going to be a violation and that's going to get reported and we're going to send it to code enforcement and we're going to take action against and following the process that we talked about here. Now, it's all about like the balance. Like if you just have the one person calling saying, hey, I heard someone go in the backyard on the phone and they were talking on the phone and it was, that's different. And these are targeted for these worst offenders of the large parties, the, the uh, pool parties until late until the early morning hours. That's what's going to be. And it's going to be driven by video evidence by uh, code enforcement or police being able to see that and, and be able to take that violation. But we're really hoping the point of this ordinance is for the self-compliance that the 
residents there are going to see the rules that the owners who are running these uh, facilities in the city, that they're going to be able to use these rules. And really, it's going to support some of the owners to be able to say, hey, I'm not being the one making the rules. The city of Santa Rosa sets these rules. And then owners always have the ability that you're seeing across the state of adding in some of their own restrictions, that if they get fined by this, then you're going to pass that on to the renter there. And then so that is like a little bit of a, uh, a investment for them to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to make sure that we're inside at nine o'clock at night because they don't want that additional fine that you're gonna put on them if the police get called or code enforcement get called. So that's where I think we could all use these rules to each one of our advantage to hopefully get some of that compliance so the police department and code enforcement aren't getting the call and you don't have the angry neighbor there who's up at two in the morning trying to get some sleep. Thank you, John. Okay, so um, there was a question to clarify the 45 minute rule. If an issue is raised and the host is able to resolve it over the phone with their guests, is the property manager owners, owner still required to be on site? Definitely not. The on site is only if necessary. Ideally, that local contact can get in touch with the um, person that rented the short term rental and say, hey guys, you need to fix this um, and, and have that be the resolution. The, the idea is to, to make, um, we're trying to make everybody happy, which is probably impossible here, but we're trying to make it so that, as, as John has repeated a couple of times, there, there's self-monitoring, there's self-enforcement um, of trying to allow these activities in an area where they're typically not seen. And, I, and I've, I can't follow the chat, but I've seen a few things pop up time and time again about what about long-term rentals? What about long-term? And that, that's a separate issue. And that doesn't mean that that, you know, if you guys wanna push for extended noise hours throughout the city, then that's something absolutely, write your council members. Um, this is addressing one particular type of activity and that's short-term rentals. And we're trying to make it so that it's, it's able to be in neighborhoods where some of these activities would not normally be happening on such a regular basis. And I think um, the other last thing, and then we'll move on to another category, is when does it become a violation if the contact doesn't respond, um, or and uh, if a permit is revoked? Uh, I think it's really the question is when does something turn into a violation? Um, is it repeated or? Um, we're it? we're actually starting it with any violation of um, the restrictions of the chapter kicks in that first penalty. And for most people, I would think that'll be the last time it happens. Um, when somebody gets their permit, they're going to already sign um, something that acknowledges all of the requirements of the chapter. So they're the ordinance. So they're gonna understand what's expected of them and their guests. And so, yes, if the local contact person that they have hired or that is them does not respond when we call them, on that 24 seven basis, that is a violation. Um, that's just, yes, that's how it, that's how it'll work. Okay, going on to permits. Um, so there are a number of questions about permits. Um, the one is, I am unclear about obtaining a permit. Is it just to keep tabs on how many hosted rentals there are or to reduce the number of rentals? And how do you get one? Some cities have them on lottery basis. What's the, what's the process on, in Santa Rosa? And that relates to a couple other things like are we gonna cap it um, or, and how are we running in, in that way? So one of the things that we're working on, um, it, it's such a comprehensive, complex situation. We're gonna actually create a, a, a short-term rental permit, which does not exist in the city right now. Um, and we will be uh, modeling it after a temporary use permit because that's that's an annual permit, um, which is what we will be looking at here. And at this point, we don't have any cap in the um, draft ordinance. That is something that we were we've heard strongly about from our constituents, and um, so it's it's likely that that will be looked at in the comprehensive ordinance and again city council the night of the meeting could decide to to enact a moratorium they could you know provide a cap it's really up to them we are not going with a recommended maximum at this time we you know we would like to study that a little bit more to figure out the best way to do it 
um, but it, it is likely to, to be seen in the comprehensive ordinance. Um, let's see, if approved, oh, sorry. I just, I just, sorry, I just forgot. We're trying to set it up so that the permit will actually be very automated. You'll be able to do it all online. Um, you'll, you'll have a, a permit application that you'll fill out online and up, upload some documents like your transient occupancy tax certificate, um, a plot plan that shows where your parking requirements, how they can be met and a floor plan showing the number of bedrooms. And then you're just gonna, you know, there'll be a little matrix where you figure out what your maximum, maximum occup occupancy can be based on the number of bedrooms and parking and that type of thing. We're trying to make it as easy and as automated as possible. It's not ready yet. Nobody can apply for a permit yet because we're, we're just now developing it. This is all a moving target. And we have a special group that's you know working on that that's met several times. Um, Trying to figure out how to make it as easy as possible um, for folks. And, and if someone is currently hosting, will they be able to continue to host while they're going through the permit process? That is one of the things that we have in the draft ordinance, that as long as a um, person that is currently operating a short-term rental applies for their permit, and when I say applies, that means they, they have all of the documents that are necessary and sends in that application, they will have um, within 45 days, or no, actually I, I moved it to 50 because the hall, the Thanksgiving holiday, there'll be 50 days um, after the ordinance passes for those people to, to submit their application and information. And those operators will be considered operating in good standing and they'll be allowed to continue. Um, they'll have to use their transient occupancy tax number in their advertisements um, until the short-term rental permit is issued and approved, and then it would switch to then showing the short-term rental permit number in their advertisements. And um, did you, you might have just said this, but I was doing something else. Um, did, did you say notifications um, would be required? Like would, would um, people seeking an application uh, or a permit be required to notify neighbors? Did you mention that already? I didn't. And the notification is after the permit is issued, and it's more to provide that 24-7 contact information to your neighbors so that they're not calling the police. Um, a good way to avoid a violation is to, you know, just avoid, avoid the city, avoid having code enforcement, police or fire involved, have that 24 seven contact, your neighbor contacts them, the issues dealt with, we don't even know, there's no violation. We don't, we don't, we don't have to know about that. Um, but it, will provide your neighbors an opportunity to know who to call and um, the occupancy rate will be included on there and parking type of thing. We haven't we haven't even ironed that out yet. That's still something in progress. It's something we'll model probably after what the county does. The county does something very similar. Um, but the idea is to just be proactive and, and let your neighbors know this is who they need to call if there's an issue. And we'd like to believe that most operators are great operators and they want to, you know, to, to do, have their neighbors happy and that type of thing. So that's kind of the goal here is that, that we're all winning. Um, and then lastly, just on this part of that, um, if approved, how soon will, uh, will they be able to apply for permits? And then also, um, given the assumed number that would come in um, fairly immediately, um, what is the turnaround time uh, for, for doing that? I think there is some concern about um, uh, being able to operate while you're processing it um, and the a fear of having to cancel, um, cancel reservations during the processing time. And that's definitely not the goal. Um, so that's where that get them get your application in you know within that 45 day period so you're an operator in good standing and you can keep operating you can keep renting you can keep advertising like i said you'll just have to include your transient occupancy tax certificate number on your advertisements um, and you'll still be responsible for following all the regulations and operating standards that are within the ordinance but you're still going to be allowed to operate we're not going to ask anybody to cancel any reservations if you don't get your application in within that period of time, regardless of if it takes us three months or two months or, or six weeks to, to apply for it, you're gonna be fine if that application is in. If you don't, then that's a violation. 
Um, and then um, I'm going to go through a couple more and then I feel like we can probably open up because there are like a hundred more. Um, yeah, things I feel like maybe, maybe, maybe people are thinking they have to put their comments no. in the chat. We're trying to get to a place where if you, if you want to ask your comment, um, you know, personally, then that that's okay too. So um, yeah, I just, there were so many that were sort of similar. I wanted to get through them. Um, there's two more categories and one is um, water. So Colin, um, water and uh, sewage services should be charged at a higher rate. Do you want to talk about, um, is there, uh, th about how water is looking at um, water sewer uses for um, short-term rentals versus long-term rentals or owner occupy? Yeah, so currently water meters in uh, the residential sector of the city all have the same water rates. And those are based on um, the assumption that there's long-term occupancy. So in the water department, we are starting to study this. We don't yet have a list of all of the folks who are operating these as hosted and non-hosted. So we need to gather more data to better understand what is the actual water use typically in these kinds of units. And that will help us determine what we need to do in terms of those water rates. Um, really the city for most purposes, you know, about 73 to 75 percent of our water is consumed in the residential sector, and that is a given rate. And yes, there is a commercial rate for water, um, but we need to study it better to better understand what kind of use this really mimics, what what this looks like. Uh, and then sewer fees, additionally, that is typically set in the residential sector, as residents know, uh, that's set during that, uh, the, what would be our wettest part of the year so that we can assume that most of the water that's being used is water that's actually going down the drain and to the sewer. So we get a sense of how much throughout the year that residents is using for sewer fees. So again, we need to study this because we have not had a, a comprehensive set of data to really look at water use patterns, water use characteristics for this particular kind of user class. So uh, we are talking about it, we're looking at it, we're thinking about it, but again, we need to collect some more data before we can definitively bring something forward. And then the last thing before we open it up, I want to say is there's a question about um, transient occupancy taxes and, um, and uh, the Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Assessment Funds. And if, um, if uh, current renter, rentals that are registered to pay and, and do pay the TOT would be grandfathered in, or would they need to apply for permits? They do need to be, apply for permits. There's no grandfather uh, clausing anybody in. Um, that is a separate issue than this ordinance would be. Um, and then, so with that, I think we should open it up. I will say there are a number of people who are not, um, uh, I think who are not um, short-term rental providers. And so I'm hoping, uh, so we're capturing the comments of everybody, but um, my hope is that we have um, an opportunity to, for uh, those who are operating STRs to be able to ask questions so we can get to those as well. I just wanted to also um, ask the question, uh, will we be producing some sort of an, a summary FAQ for the STR owner operators that is based on some of what we've heard and, and seen and responded to here? Will we be producing some sort of an FAQ? I think uh, I'll speak to that. I think we're gonna do our best to put as many responses and themes on our website as, as possible. And we heard a lot of themes. So some of it is answered in the ordinance itself. And I realize it just came out. So we're all getting to know what it, it is the contents in there. A lot of questions can be answered by looking at the ordinance, but others are um, more nuanced. And we'll, we'll speak to that as best we can. Certainly we're hearing that. Um, so we're gonna populate that website um, all the way up to the public hearing date to try to be responsive to what we're hearing. Um, do you want to take questions? So um, Charles Metz, um, we have a, a series of people who have their hands raised and we can start with the top if you like. I think we should do it. Let's okay. get to questions. Um, Michelle, will you help with that part of it? I'm not sure. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to share my screen and put a two minute timer up. Um, and then I will call on your name and give you permissions to speak. Um, once you are unmuted, your timer will start. Um, for the participants that have called in, 
if you press star six, I believe it will raise your virtual hand um, and then it will be star nine to unmute. All right, so let me get my screen shared very quickly. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So our first speaker is Charles. Charles, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute now. Hi, my name is Charles Metz. Um, a lot of people who operate hosted short-term rental out of their home offer more than two rooms and limiting hosting rent, hosted rentals to no more than two rooms would negatively affect their income they're living on. I'm with Sonoma County Coalition of Hosts and the majority of our hosts are women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, like my mother-in-law. And this needed income is helping them make ends meet because things aren't getting any cheaper. And hosted rentals haven't been a big problem because the owner is present, allowing them to use all their rooms in their home. Um, if there is any noise issue, the owner is going to be there to take care of it because they want to sleep too. Um, and short-term rentals should be in all types of housing. So lower and middle income folks can provide a room or home short-term. If you only allow homes in certain zones, which are usually more expensive homes to be used short-term, you're going to create a policy where only the wealthy will be able to own a short-term rental and only the wealthy will be able to, to stay in a short-term rental. Allow anyone in whatever zone they're in the ability to make short-term rental income from their home. Um, for parking, you should look at the county guidelines. They have one on-site parking requirement for two rooms or two on-site parking requirements for three or four rooms because the majority of people who stay in non-hosted vacation rentals are families. And when families go on a trip, they don't say, let's all go in separate cars. Um, no, whether they're on a, a road trip or flying in, they have or rent one car. That's why the county ordinance is written as it is. Um, also, people like myself, sometimes we offer rooms short term in our primary home and sometimes we offer the whole home short term. There needs to be ability for homeowners to do that. Thank you very much um, for allowing me to make my comment. Great, thank you so much. Um, give me just one moment. Next we have Eric. Eric, you should now have a prompt allowing you to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. And I appreciate the time to make some comments today. Um, my point of view, though, is I have absolutely no buy-in on your process. Uh, being a very skilled researcher and uh, able to put together the information through public records requests, none of the information that you use to launch this urgency ordinance can be factually verified. And that concerns me. It indicates that this is a bad faith effort. Furthermore, when we started to look and compare data that we were able to get from public records requests, we found that the complaints that are alleged by the police department here in these calls and in the August meeting, none of that verifies out. In fact, what happens frequently is that properties that have some sort of disturbance are labeled at a, as STRs when in fact they're not. Um, there's a bunch of data in the August meeting that tried to say that there's hundreds of these STRs operating. There's no proof of that. Thanks for making that comment though, because it does go and helps us prove the malfeasance in collecting taxes from the platform, which is something that has been going on now for several years. So, I imagine there's a few hundred thousand dollars that you'll probably be accountable for, uh, City. Um, the, the, it's not easy to dismiss the differences between STR gas and long-term residents. When we put the complaint manifest together, we found hundreds of homes with multiple noise complaints. How come those aren't addressed? What we didn't find is any complaint fact pattern about STRs. So what about that? While I can appreciate your lip service to transparency and communication, this is the first time STR owners and managers have been brought to the table, but yet by your own admission, these are problems that you guys have been conjuring up now for several months. No, this whole process is, protect, is a, an example of bad faith negotiation. And it'll be a case study, potentially case law. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much. Our next, um, our next speaker will be Brett. I believe that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I, if I, if I did not pronounce that correctly. Um, Rhett, you should have a, a prompt allowing you to unmute yourself now. Yes, can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Go oh, ahead. Perfect. This is actually, I'm attending this meeting with Rhett and with Amy. My name is Chris. I am an STR operator, host operator, and I rent out two rooms in my home. My comments are related to a question about the enforcement. Will the enforcement of whatever ordinances end up uh, being passed, will, will there be some additional staff members from the city or um, how will it be, how will it be enforced? Is it mainly going to be driven just by complaints, which seems a little, well, that's one question. If it's going to be solely driven by complaints or if there will be someone uh, doing some of this enforcement. And my second comment is really about the parking. It seems that um, I have, where I live in uh, here, near the fairgrounds, one of my neighbors has nine cars and another one has five cars and a permanent large trailer in their driveway. N neither of them have short-term or long-term tenants um, or renters. So it seems like if there's going to be an ordinance limiting the number of parking spaces for my guests, I use zero parking spaces. I park in my driveway. Um, I have a one car drive garage. And so I'm just curious how there will be an equitable in, in, in equitable enforcement of parking when it seems that there is a gap currently for regular res residences. And those are really my two, my two comments and, and, uh, and within that a concern. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, next we have, um, Carl, Carl, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. I am unmuted. Great, your time starts now, thank you. My name is Carl, I host in Santa Rosa and uh, along with my son and his girlfriend. And I wanna really just talk about the uh, difference for us between hosted and unhosted rentals. We, uh, we engage in hosted rentals. Um, and so that means one of us is here to handle any of the nuisance complaints that would come up. In fact, I was a host in San Francisco for almost 20 years before there was an Airbnb. When I um, adopted my kids from the foster care system, it was a great way for me to be a single dad, afford to live in San Francisco, raise my kids, uh, and um, not have to work crazy hours just to do it. I could be home with them sometime. And usually it was me calling the cops on my neighbors to keep things quiet so my guests could sleep. Um, our, our, um, our rules about noise are stricter than the ordinance that you are proposing. Uh, so we agree with them. We think safety is important. We think mitigating noise is important. We think parking is important. Where I'm a little puzzled is not understanding why um, hosted rentals would be limited to two bedrooms but an unhosted rental could use all the bedrooms in the house if I'm reading the ordinance correctly. And I might not be. So I'd love to hear from someone if I've misunderstood that um, and what the rationale is. Additionally, if I have to go down from four bedrooms to two bedrooms, that means I'm not referring half, I'm referring half the number of people to local restaurants, cafes, small businesses, made local stores. I'm buying less things from uh, local businesses for my guests. And I think at a time when everyone's trying to recover from the pandemic, limiting the number of people that can patronize our restaurants is not the way to go. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Next, we have Rick. Rick, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. Yes, I saw that, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, so I am a uh, short-term rental owner. I am a hosted rental. 
It's uh, I use one bedroom and I do limit it to two people in the bedroom. And I've been doing this for nine years in the city of Santa Rosa. And just so that everyone can understand, uh, short term rentals provide a great economic impact to the city. Over the last nine years, I've paid more than $15,000 in TOT and BIA taxes. In addition, I've referred numerous guests to local restaurants, to bars, to venues, to a number of uh, places where they're spending local dollars. And these people have traveled from all over the world virtually. Uh, the other thing that I'm a little disappointed with is that we really haven't had the opportunity as short-term rental owners to really provide input to this process. This is a great start, but it really doesn't get into uh, working with us to allow us to give you input in terms of how we run our business, what the business challenges for us are, what we pay to make sure that our guests are comfortable, safe, and are in an environment where they feel very positive about their experience visiting Santa Rosa because we are ambassadors for the city of Santa Rosa. We want every guest to have a five-star experience when they come. And uh, we wanna make sure that we don't impact our neighbors and our neighborhoods, that it's as, that it's as, as, as uh, transparent and also as, as uh, less impactful on the neighborhood as anything else would be. The biggest impact in my neighborhood is actually my neighbors being noisy and using parking spaces way beyond what they should normally use. Thank you for your time. That's a good one. Great, thank you so much. Next, we have David. David, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. I see it, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Well, that's terrific. Um, yeah, I'd like to just point out that there is a distinct difference between a privilege and a right. Uh, Short-term rentals actually have no right to exist. They currently only enjoy the privilege to exist because the city of Santa Rosa has lagged a bit behind all other surrounding governments in establishing a reasonable ordinance that limits the ability of specifically non-hosted short-term rentals to operate. I don't think any traditional homeowner has ever said, oh, I wish the house next to me was a non-hosted short-term rental. And other than income, the city has really little incentive to allow non-hosted short-term rentals to continue operating. Um, the unrestricted privilege for these non-hosted short-term rentals is really about to close, especially for those that are owned and operated by corporate interests and irresponsible individual owners. Most short-term rental owners and operators really don't seem, and judging from the chat tonight, to appreciate the disruptive potential and the disruptive reality that comes from a constant rotation of short-term renters to their property. You know, it's really past time that they be made aware of that and act responsibly as an entire group. So it was a great meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Next, we have Nancy. Nancy, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you, go okay. ahead. Today is my first time to uh, join the, this Zoom meeting. I cannot believe, my name is Nancy Wang. I'm the resident in Santa Rosa for 44 years. And uh, we have a neighbor. Um, they have Airbnb. I'm not no complaining because they are hosted. They are in the site. They always keep the property nice, parking at their own property. But I I noticed lately, as a lot of house, big house for sale, these big corporation coming in to turn the house to Airbnb. This is really disappointing to our city to allow to giving permit for this kind of big corporation. The people moving into our community, they want to have a nice community living. It's not a living next to the hotel. That's I'm concerned. I live in this area for 44 years. 
and my all my children growing up here, my grandchildren's here, and I will see a lot of different. The you talking about permit looks like um, the city's already decided to issue this permit. You just make the rule how the enforcement and this and that. I don't think I should say we should abandon this big corporation permit for the RMB has to be host on site. Because I go to the vacation, you know, everywhere. I, I go to the Airbnb, but though they all has host on site. So you never can be anything wrong. You want to keep the rule, everything. You know, you even say can call the police, but it's not going to help. You ruin the whole neighborhood. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Next, we have um, Eric. Eric, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. My name's actually Maureen, Eric's wife. I don't have a, I think the umbrella of the hosted versus unhosted should not, they shouldn't be under the same umbrella. I don't have a problem with hosted. I've stayed at numerous Airbnbs that are hosted. They're wonderful. That's great. We live next door to an unhosted Airbnb. This woman will never live here. She has four or five others that we were able to discover. Um, and they have a pool. Literally, I can spit over the fence to the pool. That's how close it is to my home. And they, the, the visitors, you know, that's the attraction is this pool. And they are back there from morning till late at night. The last weekend, they smoked pot continuously. We had to shut all windows, all doors, couldn't go outside. Um, I mean, there is no oversight. Even if I called someone, it's, it's a continuous party. That's what the attraction is. They're on vacation. We work. Our master bedroom is literally right on top of their pool. Um, so I think maybe it needs to be an individual by individual where the city comes out and says, you know, maybe a house has to be a certain distance away from each other or something. But for God's sakes, when you buy a home in a beautiful neighborhood that's quiet and peaceful, and all of a sudden, like the previous woman said, it's like a corporation comes in and totally does away with your neighborhood feeling. And it, I can't tell you how stressful it has been. Um, I'm almost in tears. It's where you want to move away, but you can't because now we have to disclose that there's an Airbnb. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, it looks like I'm not seeing any other hands at this time. Um, oh, we do have one other one. And then I know that there was actually a few more just raised, but I do know that a clarification needed to be made. Um, do we want, um, Paul, if you would like to go ahead and do the clarification really quick, and then I can move on to these three other commenters. Sure, so one of the questions uh, that we heard uh, offline and uh, tonight in some of the chat was, uh, are some of these rules uh, that are part, uh, part of the ordinance enforceable and or applicable to some of the neighboring? And yes, a lot of these are out of the California Fire Code, California Vehicle Code, uh, but typically uh, either the police department or the fire department can go and write a ticket tomorrow for anybody blocking a fire hydrant. Um, and there's a fine associated with it and uh, we go on with our day. Our goal with some of these things is to deal with some of the repeat offenders. So part of what CC had outlined earlier uh, was almost uh, in essence like progressive enforcement. So although we may be able to take action on a lot of these issues, uh, either independently through our fire department with an outside agency, 
uh, having them included in this ordinance allows us to get it to the point where if the violator is conducting the activity multiple times, then it can get to the point where we can re revoke that permit and then it deals with the issue. And again, goes back to, to trying to make the community safer. Uh, and Paul, um, while you're on that, can you just, there was a question, will there be special rules on uh, in the WUI? Um, and I don't know if that's something, if you've already addressed that um, or if it's worth uh, addressing now. So yeah, we we are looking um, both as part of the urgency order. A, a lot of these uh, the the items that we've outlined in the ordinance are specific to uh, uh, WUI needs. So the, whether it's the evacuation checklist, the um, the SoCo alert opt in. Um, the rules regarding the fire access, things of that nature, uh, although they're applicable around the city, they are uh, ultimately uh, more of an urgent issue in and around our wildland urban interface. Uh, we're continuing to look at uh, additional rules that would potentially be applicable specifically to our wildland urban interface um, as part of the more comprehensive ordinance. But again, the goal was to tackle the most uh, critical needs that rose to the top right now under the urgency ordinance. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dale. Oops. Dale, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. Yes, I see it. Okay, great. Go ahead. So I actually moved to Santa Rosa about a year ago, and I was lucky to move right next door to a uh, short-term rental party house. And it has been nonstop. Uh, the frequency of the short-term rental guests is insane. 75% uh, of the month is usually occupied. The turnover rate is eight to 10 groups of guests. And each one is a whole new learning experience. It is a unhosted STR. Uh, I can't emphasize, and you can see this from all the comments and from the city of how this is destroying our city. Um, we need to save our Santa Rosa. So that's, you know, that's the biggest thing. The neighborhoods are being destroyed by this. Um, the way the, the draft ordinance is written right now, every house around me could become a short-term rental. That's insane. We need to put a limit. There should be a limit of one in 30 days per period. Um, I, I just, that's the only way to control this. I don't see any other way uh, unless you want to just completely stop all STRs, which I don't think that's the, that's the right process. I do think a limitation on stays. I think a moratorium on new SDRs is desperately needed. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Cami. Cami, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Thanks. I just wanted to make um, a general point about some of the ordinance seeming inequitable. Um, one is a parking requirement of one spot per bedroom. I think this is easier for larger properties in nicer neighborhoods to comply with. Um, my short-term rental is in a suburban area um, of homes built in the 1950s. So we have a, a small driveway and the garage. I know uh, Sherry mentioned that she thought a lot of short-term rental, rentals have empty garages, but we actually use this for storage for a lot of the things we need. And for when we come and visit the house, when it's not being rented out. Um, so I think the parking requirement is, in, is not equitable to smaller properties. I also think the requirement about barbecues and grills needing to be 25 to 50 feet away from anything flammable is also inequitable to smaller properties. Um, my backyard is pretty large actually for the size of the house, but I don't have a 25 foot clearance of non-flammable things, including, you know, that would include my wooden, wooden deck or an umbrella. 
So um, I'd like a general equity assessment for this ordinance to be conducted to see how equitable it is um, across different types of STRs. Also, um, I appreciate that you invited short-term rental operators to this space, but I would like to have a more engaging conversation with the city and other short-term rental operators. We all have unique circumstances that can't be um, all completely addressed in one ordinance. So it, it would be nice to know the different nuances between, between different types of um, short-term rentals out there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so it looks like we have um, four more hands up. So I think we should take those four hands. And then if we could take some of the questions out of the chat, um, I think it's important to touch on those as well. Um, and then we can come back to raised hands if there are any at that point. Um, so next we have Mary. Mary, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. Hello, yes, thanks very much. Um, I hold a unique situation here. Um, I once owned an Airbnb and was a host. I am a real estate agent and I actually um, am living now next to an Airbnb. And I have to say that it is uh, a unique experience and not all um, hosted rentals or short-term rentals or long-term rentals or even owned uh, homes are the same. We all are not perfect neighbors. And with, uh, with the short-term rentals, there are so many opportunities to bring economics to our cities and the areas that they, they are in. I have to tell you, uh, when I was an Airbnb host and the fire swept through, Santa Rosa, I cannot tell you how many people gained a place to have refuge and think about what has just happened in their life to regroup. If there were no short-term rentals, that haven would not have been there. I cannot tell you how many engineers, insurance people, and so forth, who came here to help our community, uh, used my Airbnb to stay for a while to help people. We live in a wine tourism area and we've lost two hotels uh, that were part of that. And there is an economy that comes to this town to help, especially after COVID. We have registered nurses and traveling doctors that use short-term rentals. There is no easy solution. One plan will not fit everyone, but I think that we all have to look at ourselves as neighbors, whether we own, rent, short term or what have you, that if we're not doing anything out of law or to harm anybody, it all should be considered. Great, thank you so much. Um, next we have Liza. Liza, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, Thanks for all your work on this um, rental ordinance. Um, I just wanted to um, present a couple ideas. I'm a Airbnb host. We have um, a property um, in the junior college neighborhood that has two small Airbnbs as well as a long-term unit. Um, and it's also one of those properties that has kind of a unique parking situation where it has a very long driveway with a single car garage. So it technically could park like three cars, um, but it's not practically, not that practical to park three cars. Um, so I guess to what I was going to say was I really appreciate all the, the nuance and that you haven't taken a black and white approach to, um, to the issue of regulating short-term rentals. Um, and I think it would be wonderful to just add some further nuance to the, um, to the, the regulation as it stands now, um, such as like a process for applying for an exception to the parking um, part of the permit that might involve like, um, you know, getting neighbors to sign off on the parking situation. Um, 
if there really hasn't been any issues with parking and for your particular property or some some type of process like that. The other thing I was hoping a little more nuance could be um, applied is about the hosted and non hosted rentals. So another we um, also Airbnb our primary residence when we go on vacation and it's a really helpful source of income for us. And it's kind of a different thing than I think um, having a completely non hosted rental um, because we are good we know our neighbors they have all our contact information and we're very invested in the neighborhood we're in um and so and i know in other cities they do um apply more nuance to to that um aspect of it being your primary residence okay thank you so much um next we have Gay, Gay, you should have um, a prompt allowing you to unmute. Yes. Perfect, go ahead. I want to agree with the people that have been saying so far that there should be some kind of a separation between the hosted rentals and the unhosted rentals. I am a hosted rental for Airbnb in the city of Santa Rosa, and I have had numerous people uh, my neighbors use me for what their overflow when they have birthdays or weddings or whatever. We not only just get along, they love it. I have a drive, I have a parking bay off my driveway. So there's no problem with off street parking and I'm there. So if there's going to be any issues, I basically it's, it's never been a problem. And during the fire, when, when there was a, caller that came in, I was able to host, I was able to take in somebody who'd lost their homes in Coffee Park, you know, that wouldn't have been able to, I couldn't have done that if I didn't have my um, guest house that I was using. And I just see a lot of positives that can be um, seen with hosted rentals, that there was another caller that came, that was saying that some corporation was going to come in and ruin the neighborhood, that seems like a totally separate issue to lump us all together. And I kind of feel like the separation between people that are living there, part of the community, and people who are not doing that for short-term rentals should be um, taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, Erica, Erica, you should have a prompt allowing you to unmute. Yes, thank you so much. Great, go ahead. Hello everyone, thank you so much for all of your thoughts. I'm really happy that I'm here. I um, live in a neighborhood where we are seeing many of these big unhosted type short-term rentals. And that really is, is my biggest concern because I really enjoyed hearing all of the hosted feedback and all of your stories and of the wonderful things that you've done. And I agree, I've stayed in hosted Airbnbs myself. I think my, my issue is, is twofold. Number one, it's, it's an issue of density. Um, I don't think that the ordinance has made any sort of, you know, um, thoughts as to how close they can be to each other on my street. Just within the last couple of weeks, we've had two new Airbnbs that are less than 300 feet from each other. And they're both five bedroom homes with pools. And these are the homes that are being most problematic, especially when they are unhosted, because these are the ones that, you know, people like everyone said, people want to go on vacation. They want to have fun. They want to, you know, <laughs> live it up and they should, but this is a residential area. I, I moved here with my husband who was born and raised in Santa Rosa so we could raise our children, so we could walk them to the elementary school, so we could be part of the community. And based on what I'm hearing from everybody else on this call, there are short-term rentals that are hosted that are just such wonderful additions to our community and they are fantastic and we need them. And yes, we are part of the wine industry. Yes, we need tourism. Yes, we need places for overflow birthday parties and, and, you know, all the holidays. Yes, we need you. And I'm so one, happy that you are part of the community, but what we don't need are 
the big large corporations that are buying the big homes in this neighborhood to turn them into party homes. That, that really is my concern because to me, it's all about community. That's why I moved to Santa Rosa to raise my children. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Okay, so it looks like um, that was the, our last grouping of hands. So um, let me stop sharing my screen if you guys would like to address some of the questions in the chat now. Um, yeah, so the, the last two questions that I pulled out um, from the chat are on um, the permit costs. So Sherry, if you could talk about um, the permit costs and also if you could clarify, um, there is a question of why hosted rentals are limited to two bedrooms and unhosted are not. So if you could sweep those last two um, in and then Claire um, to close it out. Um, is uh, again to, to uh, discuss the or explain the urgency ordinance and then the comprehensive ordinance. Thank you, Ray. So you've done such a great job. It's a lot of questions coming at you and you themed them well. I appreciate that. So um, the question about two bedrooms, this is common. Some jurisdictions only allow one per um, hosted rental. And the city is currently evaluating the bed and breakfast ordinance um, or the, the requirements for bed and breakfast, because once you've gone beyond two bedrooms, it's typically considered a bed and breakfast use, which has its own um, per permitting process. So we're not saying you can't do it. We're just saying that at that point, you're considered a bed and breakfast and would have to follow those requirements. And again, this is stuff that, you know, we'll see we're going by what other jurisdictions did rather than just saying one we're allowing two um so that's that's how we came up with the two bedrooms it was the the um least restrictive of what i had seen in terms of, of hosted um stating a bedroom um as far as the fees go we are comparing this to a temporary use permit in terms of the level of review and analysis required um, a temporary use permit is eleven hundred and twenty nine dollars there is not a um, public hearing fee attached to that. It will be a director level decision. Um, so that's where uh, we're at with the um, permit process. And uh, I'm, good evening, I'll, I'll touch on where we're headed um, with the urgency ordinance versus where we're gonna be headed with the comprehensive. And, um, a number of you said we, we want more time. We want to, we have a lot more to discuss. Um, this can't be the only meeting and you're right. It, it can't be the only meeting and we have lots more to discuss. Um, you guys raised a number of different things and we're paying attention to those. So the comprehensive ordinance will take place over the next several months. There will be many more opportunities to engage with staff um, and not necessarily in these big formats, but you know, we'll, you'll have, you'll have access to staff to ask your specific questions. Um, what the urgency ordinance is about is, is really about an immediate um, addressing of the issue that has emerged. And we're looking at life safety. We're looking at operational standards. Um, we're looking at accountability, frankly. And I heard from a lot of folks tonight um, that a lot of um, vacation rentals are handled appropriately. And um, frankly, I, I think that's quite true. Um, and those aren't the ones that are generating complaints. And so what we've tried to do is set up, what are some basic operational standards that um, coincide with, with those that are compatible? And we're trying to um, come up with those. So obviously parking and occupancy, um, noise, those are the number one issues that we have. And they're usually on the excessive level, which is what constitutes the complaint. So we're trying to bring that back and model after those that are good, good neighbors. Um, and it's just, it's, it's an interim um, circumstance. So again, we wanna focus on registration and accountability, um, give operators who are, are compatible and sensitive an opportunity to be recognized for that. Um, and, but also hold those accountable who are um, resulting in complaints or levels of incompatibility or in the worst cases, life safety issues. So that's what we're focused on. Um, the council wanted us to act quickly. They didn't want to wait for the comprehensive ordinance that would take several months. 
And the reason is we don't have any regulations for short-term rentals. So we are, we're in a state where we can't help with the help as, as effectively as we would like um, to, 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 to make the, the operators who are creating issues for their neighbors. We can't, there's really no mechanism unless you have some regulation. So the urgency ordinance will provide for that, but we wanted to keep it lean and keep it matching with the operators that are in good standing. Um, so that, that's kind of the focus of what we're doing, but we are taking in all your, your comments and there's gonna be a lot more discussions moving, moving past October 12th. This is really kind of the beginning. It's not, it's not the, the end. So with that, do we, uh, have we um, got to all the questions? Are we ready to, uh, are we going to have an opportunity to reflect back the themes that we heard? I know there was a number of themes and, and um, I've been taking notes and I'm sure all of uh, staff has as well, but do we have a summary that we can provide? We do. Awesome. Uh, Sherry, did you want me to do that? Um, and I have to thank Angie Triple for that, uh, unless Angie, you'd like to come on and provide that summary. I, was, I have my head buried in the uh, comments document that I've been working on. Um, mm -hmm. If you wanna kick it off and then I can, I can um, you know, we can kind of share it if you'd like to do that. Um, well, I think um, your your summary of key themes that you had listed out, we came up with nine, and so I thought you could just review those. Um, okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Great. So um, these are just major themes that we'll be uh, exploring more fully, and your feedback's really important. So we'll be able to go back and reflect on the ordinance uh, with a lot of the comments and questions that have, have uh, been brought up this evening. But first, we had a lot of comments about parking, both uh, concerns about the proposed parking requirement um, but also many people talked about concerns of, you know, the parking issues that long-term residents are causing in neighborhoods as well. And so, um, of course, uh, CC is, is here this evening and we do have the code enforcement uh, code violation process where you can submit a, a code violation if you feel that uh, someone is parking inappropriately in your neighborhood. So the, uh, the code enforcement process is a great uh, venue to follow up on issues that you might have from long-term residents or uh, permanent residents. Uh, we provided some clarification on the 45-minute rule. And I think as Sherry noted, um, we can look at that 45-minute that time frame and see if we need to adjust that. Um, I believe expand it to be uh, more reasonable and allow for more effective responsiveness. Then um, we had a lot of questions about enforcement and, and how enforcement would happen. And I think that as the as we finalize the urgency ordinance and as it moves forward, um, Jesse and Cece will be working with their teams very closely to um, better refine enforcement and and be able to provide more guidance about how that looks. Um, and then questions, of course, about the permitting process because the urgency ordinance does propose establishment of the short term rental permit. Uh, as Sherry briefly mentioned, that we are are working furiously, in fact, to um, set up both online and in-person application submittal processes. And uh, we will, we fully intend to have a robust online platform for both pre-application development as well as application submittal. So we will uh, be providing those resources to support applicants. And, um, and then we also talked about the fact that if you are a current operator, that you that at this point in time the ordinance does not require a cessation of operations but that you would have to submit that applicant application and have an application under review in order to continue to operate as well as we touched on the fee and at present the uh, the proposed fee is one thousand one hundred and twenty nine dollars uh, for the um, short-term rental permit uh, there were some some great questions about over concentration and um, and the density or number of short term units uh, um, operations in a neighborhood, and uh, I think that that's um, certainly prompted by the by the the nature of the urgency ordinance coming forward and will be more fully addressed then in the comprehensive ordinance uh, when we've had time to do the data analyses 
uh, that's needed in order to support um, a, an approach, a potential approach to overconcentration issues. And then we received some, some uh, awesome comments about uh, standards and regulations. Of course, the urgency ordinance, the primary goal is to provide some regulations to, um, to, to support the effective operation of, of short-term rental um, units. And, and so we'll be reviewing your comments and reviewing the standards and regulations as proposed in the urgency ordinance to ensure that um, we've, we've done a fine tuning of those, those short-term regulations. Uh, Colin, Colin had a great conversation about uh, addressing questions about potential impacts to water and sewer services and um, why there would not be additional charges uh, for short-term rentals for water and sewer um, services that are provided. And then I've got a, a, a great list of, of comments and questions about the development of the ordinance, the opportunity for input and such. And I think that as Claire noted, of in her comments that the comprehensive ordinance, as we move into the process of developing a comprehensive ordinance, will have a much more extended and robust uh, opportunity for um, input from both residents, but as well as short-term operators, rental operators. And then there were comments about the economic impacts, potential economic impacts of regulations and just how the industry does support, especially our local restaurant tourism, um, entertainment economy. And that's very important to be recognized as well. So uh, we thank you for submitting those comments. And um, as the economic development manager, I'm, I'm certain that Raisa has heard your comments this evening. So I think Raisa, that's, uh, that's my summary of, of the notes that we have. And um, we'll be compiling those in the upcoming days and responding to them. And I also want to um remind folks that we have recorded this meeting and we'll be posting it to the um, short-term rentals website that Raisa awesomely has put in the chat again. Um, so yeah, with that, I want to thank everybody, the panel, the attendees, and everyone else. Um, we're still collecting uh, comments and feedback at short-term rentals at srcity.org. I'm hoping that people write with specific things that they that they are addressing in the ordinance, like add, add you know, the section you're talking about. Um, of course, we'll accept any comments, but it's a little harder to um, actually tally and log and, and gain useful information um, if it's not if it's not addressed um, pursuant to the ordinance itself. So unless anybody else has any last minute thoughts, um, I think we're we're gonna say good night and and be safe and thanks all for attending. Thank you everyone. Bye now. <laughs>